Every single football club has its issues, and whilst mine, Leeds United, are currently very much on show, having not beaten Rotherham, I thought I'd just poke around other football clubs in the Premier League just to feel good about myself. So here is the problem with your football club going through fairly quickfire alphabetical order. First up, Arsenal. I think you're going to have a very serious issue with AFCON and the Asia Cup coming towards the end of the year. Losing Thomas Partey means a seriously useful holding midfielder goes, and although you don't want to lose Takahiro Tomoyasu to Bayern Munich, he's going to play for Japan anyway over January, so good luck with that one. That's always going to be fun, especially when the players are such a fundamental part of the way you play. Next up, Aston Villa, who I think are pushing on really, really well. I think they're still unbeaten at home this season, but their biggest problem at the moment is their away form. Although it's not a big problem, like... It's still fine. It's the thing that's stopping them from really pushing on and securing their place in the top four. Unai Emery's done a really, really good job, but if they're able to properly secure those away matches, they'll be completely fine. The issue with Bournemouth is a massive failed rebuild. Over the summer, they bought in a bunch of quite feasibly decent players. Tyler Adams, who then got injured. Lewis Sinistera, who's done the square root of fuck all. And Andoni Iraola, who was supposed to come to Leeds United to manage, decided not to wait till the end of the season, ended up at Bournemouth. And now here we are. It's not looking too good, to be honest. And I'm going to take a quick look at the table to see where Bournemouth are to see just how funny I'm allowed to find this. Yeah, uh, Bournemouth are currently 16th, and I think any other season they'd be at serious risk of relegation. Thankfully, there are enough awful teams down there to keep them safe. Brentford suffer from what I think is a quite big XG underperformance. You can tell that they are missing Ivan Tony at the moment. They don't have a pure centre forward to replace him, and I don't think they get to keep Ivan Tony in January. I think big money bids will come in and they will be forced to sell. There could be big problems coming for Brentford in the near future because they quite desperately need a striker at the moment. Brighton are another side that started the season in a really promising way, but have sort of stumbled as of late. They've had a very deep run of form where it's not been very good. And I think one of the bigger issues there is the fact that they've not been able to keep clean sheets. If you can't keep clean sheets, it's a lot harder to win games of football. You'll drop points absolutely everywhere. As far as I can tell, in their last at least five matches, they've not won. They're currently playing against Nottingham Forest, as I'm saying this, but even a win against them isn't a sign that the form's completely turned around. It's positive, but ending this deep slump in form is going to be huge. Burnley have a big problem. Uh, their goals against compared to their XG is absolutely off the scale. It is vastly outweighing it by something like eight. I think expected goals against is something like 22. They've conceded about 30. Closing that gap is going to be key if they want to stay up this season because you can't just keep leaking goals. We discovered that last season with Elan Melier and the season before also with Elan Melier when the defence was incredibly weak and the goalkeeper was exposed and it was impossible to get results. Chelsea have a quite different issue, and it's not so much about results and outcomes as a sort of philosophy at the club. Chelsea's biggest issue, in my opinion, is their potential to be massively impatient. Things haven't been perfect for Maurizio Pochettino so far. That is completely understandable. However, the moment form turns, will they have the patience to stick with Pochettino to hold on to him and let him build this project rather than do what they did with Potter and sort of panic and go, you have to go now. We will work something else out, but you have to go. If they're able to hold on and keep their patience, they should be completely fine. But that is the big underlying scary thing for Chelsea, I think. Crystal Palace are one of those sides where I sort of struggled with this because they don't have a big screaming problem like a lot of other clubs do. They just sort of suffer from a relative lack of creativity. Their expected goals and chances created are fairly low, and although Eberetche Eze and Michael Olise do their best to create these opportunities, they're not able to do it on their own. And they need a side around them that is able to not only create chances, but pounce on, on them when they pop up. And I don't know if Crystal Palace have that in them at the moment. Everton. This one's obvious. FFP concerns. Not only are they looking to be deducted 10 points by the end of the season, they'll try and appeal it, but I really don't see it working out. I feel like this also means that it's going to be really hard for them to spend that much money. From a Leeds United perspective, I feel like it's a shame that they won't be able to buy Jack Harrison. From their perspective, 
transfers for the foreseeable future could be a problem because they know there's going to be so much more scrutiny on their club. Away from Everton now, another one that is back on the pitch. Fulham don't have any real goal scorers. They lost Mitrovic and seemingly didn't properly replace him. The highest goal scorer this season is Jao Polina, who is a midfielder who has scored two. There's also Bobby Dickodover Reed, who also has two. They really need a centre forward that can start scoring goals and making a significant difference for them. Otherwise, they're in deep trouble the moment clubs start showing up, scoring goals, and then they don't have a way to counter. Liverpool have, I wouldn't say a similar issue, but in terms of goal-scoring players, I think you could call this an issue. I don't think there's enough support for Mo Salah. If Mo Salah gets injured, then the right wing is empty, in essence. They've got Diego Jota, who can play on the left. They've got Cody Gakpo, who can play on the left. They have Darwin Nunez, who can play on the left. They have Luis Diaz, who can play on the left. I don't think they've got enough right wingers in that squad, which means they are deeply exposed if Mo Salah gets injured, and that could be a serious problem for them. Moving on to a team at the opposite end of the table, Luton. I don't believe Luton built enough in the summer. They brought in a lot of players that were bottom-end Premier League, top-end Championship, and thought, if we put this together, it might form something that keeps us up. And who knows? In terms of that relegation scrap at the moment, they're not in it. Well, they're in the scrap, but they're not in the relegation zone. They could get away with it. I don't see it happening, though, and I think they could be in very serious trouble as the season rolls on. These players that didn't have that much chemistry going into the season start having the odd disagreement or falling out or see that Luton are very likely to go down because they're only not in the relegation zone because Everton had that points deduction. They've got a lot of work to do. I think in January they need to make some signings. On the subject of signings, Manchester City don't need to make any signings because I feel like they've got FFP charges hanging over their head. It's not a problem in this very moment. That needs to be said. They've not been charged with anything yet. They've not been found guilty of anything yet. But they are still firmly hanging directly over their head. There is still that thought of that's a massive points deduction that could be on the way and that could be an instant relegation depending on how ingrained this has been. And that could be shattering to the club's culture. Club culture is an issue at the next one as well. Man United still hate their ownership. Even if it goes to Jim Ratcliffe, there's going to be a bit of an argument going on because will they be able to play in Europe? I think it's Nice that Jim Ratcliffe also owns. So he'll need to either sell those or one of the two sides is going to get banned from European football. We'll find out. Newcastle are... having less of an issue with their ownership, but they do have a big hole in their midfield. Sandro Tonali being out for eight months is a serious problem for them, and they need to replace him with another holding midfielder. I think Calvin Phillips is probably the right shout for them, especially considering that he plays a very similar role to Tonali and would actually play football there, and I'm sure Man City want him to get off their books, and Calvin Phillips will probably want to play football. It feels like there's an easy solution, but for now there is a big hole in that midfield. Nottingham Forest, I found that their issue is they are too reliant on Taiwo Awonyi. I've never been able to pronounce that properly. That's my bad. Um, but he's scored a lot of goals for them. They've got 14 in the league so far. Awonyi got four, but he's played a fundamental part in creating others. Losing him through injury for an extended period means that, if I'm having a quick look at the league at the moment, Forest are currently 14th. And if he was in their squad, they can start to push up a little bit. Considering he isn't, there's a risk of them tumbling down a bit. Fulham are in reach. Bournemouth are in reach. Luton, if they get lucky, could try and put together a decent run of form. Problems, in essence. Now on to Sheffield United, and they are incredibly blunt in attack. They've scored 10 goals this season so far, but they probably should have scored more. Their XG is a bit higher. They're not really creating that many chances, though, and I think that is the bigger issue. They concede a hell of a lot. They've conceded the most in the league so far at the moment. They've just conceded as I'm speaking. So they've currently let in 32 goals this season. So they are very leaky. But you need to be able to attack to make up for that. And Sheffield United just do not. Next up, Spurs. Sheffield United conceding so many goals is because of a lack of quality. Spurs have an issue with a lack of discipline. Christian Romero is a red card machine. 
Destiny Udogi got a red card recently. Eve Basuma, I think, got two yellow cards, one of them for diving and got sent off as of late. And that's not good enough for a side that earlier on in the season was, in theory, pushing for the title. Currently, they have a game in hand over Man City and Liverpool and they are three points behind. So it is doable. They can make that gap up. But what's really going to matter is you need to keep winning and to do that, you need discipline and you need to be able to work better as a unit. And if you're just getting players sent off willy nilly, it won't work. Next up, this is one where I've struggled to find a massive weakness. So this one's a little bit wishy-washy, but West Ham always feel a little bit fragile to me. Now, it's quite hard to define, but whenever I'm watching West Ham, it always feels like they're teetering on the brink, hiccup, on the brink of a quite serious problem. They never properly demolish a side, and if they do, the next week they won't. So looking back through the most recent matches, it's nil-nil at the moment in today's game, but last time out was a 3-2 win against Nottingham Forest. The time before was a 3-2 loss against Brentford. The time before that, they lost to Everton, which is not good. Then they uh, lost 4-1 to Aston Villa. It feels like there's a sort of fragility with West Ham. They're always on the brink of something going wrong. And that's something that you really need to fix if you want to keep pushing into the top half of the Premier League. Then Wolves. Wolves over the past few seasons have built up a reputation of defensive solidity and being able to sort of protect themselves and maybe play some boring football, but they'd get results. They've not had a single clean sheet since August. And that is not good enough. If I remember right, that clean sheet was against Everton in a 1-0 win. That was their only clean sheet this season, aside from a win in the Carabao Cup over Blackpool. And maybe they'll get another one in January when they play, I don't know, Dorking Rangers or something like that in the FA Cup. But one league clean sheet so far in so many games is not good enough. Anyway... I'm sure a lot of people want to argue with me in the comments on that one. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Like the video if you enjoyed and subscribe. Maybe even become a channel member. It's a few quid a month. If you can afford it, be massively appreciated. And I will see you later.